Okay, thank you. Thank you for that opportunity. Um, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I want to thank the Secretary General for the opportunity to make transaction universities, all my panelists. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so I think the host needs to enable me to make and uh, to share my slides so that I can start my presentation. Um, thank you. So, um, so I'm just why I'm, I'm waiting for the host. I want to thank all everybody who joined online, um, the students and faculty of Middlesex, and those in the auditorium for this presentation. I'll be talking on nurturing a culture of innovation that fosters transformation. That's what I'll be presenting within the time allotted allotted to me. So and I'll, I'll, I'll keep to time because I know I have other speakers here. My name is Dr. Max Oluba. Uh, I, I lead an organization called Strategy House where we help organizations in the area of leadership strategy and organizational transformation. I, I'd like to start by talking about the role of leadership. I think leadership has been looked and defined in different ways, but today I want to talk about the essence of leadership here is the creation of strong and viable institutions that prosper into the future. Um, and this, this definition for me is, is, is quite powerful because it tells us that leaders need to lead the organization to succeed today. But beyond succeeding today, they need to prepare those organizations to succeed for tomorrow, succeed into the future. So your success today is like your achievements, while your success tomorrow is like your legacy. So your greatest legacy as a leader is the creation of viable institutions that will survive after you. And in order for you to create viable institutions that will survive into the future, the leader needs to institute a culture of innovation. Without the culture of innovation, that organization cannot succeed and survive into the future. So how do leaders create that culture is what I want to address today. So three major bullet points I will cover is number one, a culture of innovation. Why is it necessary? Number two, so number one is like a business case for the culture of innovation. Number two is, so what exactly is this culture of innovation? We use the word, well, what exactly does it mean? And number three is how leaders can foster a culture of innovation. I want to thank all the speakers that have gone ahead of me. You understand, I'm just writing on existing protocols. So let's get started with the culture of innovation. And uh, I, I would like to talk about the concept of a ghost town. As you can see from the screen, a ghost town is simply a deserted city, an abandoned city, but a town that the economic activities that normally supported that town no longer exists or has come to a halt. And so as a result of that, the people in that particular town has moved looking for another economic opportunities. While you can still see the structures, the infrastructures, the buildings, one thing that is absent in a ghost town is simply the people, because in this case, the people have moved. And there are a lot of lessons we can learn from this because a lot of organizations also has experienced the ghost town effect, where customers have moved, have migrated. They're looking for their next, next um, opportunity. So these are studies just to confirm uh, organizational ghost town effect. In 1955, the 500 companies, uh, the companies in the Fortune 500 in 1955, 88% are no longer in existence as of 2015. Uh, somebody will say 1955 is a long time ago, but look at just year 2000, 22 years ago, 52% of companies in Fortune 500 are no longer in existence in that Fortune 500. Some of them have gone completely bankrupt. And that's the ghost town effect here. Organizations uh, can experience this ghost town effect where customers have moved, have migrated, and that company is a shell of what it once was. So what is the biggest lesson for me from this ghost town effect is that no company is too big to fail. 
That's the biggest lesson for me from this ghost and effect. That no company is too big to fail. I think uh, one of the speakers mentioned companies have failed, the blockbusters of this world. Look at Nokia, for example. This was the Forbes article in 2007. Nokia had 1 billion customers. You can call Nokia, you can call Nokia not a company, but like an institution. You can even call Nokia a continent with 1 billion customers and four votes. Yes. 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 Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, because I'm hearing some uh, voices at the background. And Forbes wrote, can anyone catch the cell phone king? Imagine having 1 billion customers. Various studies said that in 2007, Nokia had about 50% of the global handset market. Imagine that, 50% of the global handset market. It means that if anybody buys, if two people buy phones in anywhere in the world, one of the one of them will buy a Nokia phone. That was 2007, but the rest they say is history. No company is too big to fail. That's the ghost and effect. And failure happens when companies begin to lose sight of the changes in the external environment and they fail to respond or adapt at times. Success breeds arrogance. Arrogance blinds you to the changes in the environment and makes you fail to respond. And at the end of the day, the end result is failure. So success can actually lead to failure if you fail to adapt, if you fail to innovate, if you fail to evolve. Jack West captured this in this quote that I like so much. He said, if the rate of change on the outside exceeds the rate of change on the inside, the end is near. So whether the organization is changing or not, there are a lot of changes happening on the outside in the ICT space, a lot of changes. COVID has brought a lot of changes over the last two years. So it doesn't matter what is happening on the inside, the world is changing around us. And Jack Ware says you can predict the success or the future of a business, a company, an organization, simply by asking the question, is the rate of change on the outside better than the rate of change on the inside? Once you can predict that, you can tell yourself whether that organization will be in existence in the next five to 10 years. And based on what Jack West said, this quote, I think that companies can be divided into three. So this is what I think, just looking at Jack West, using the rate of change on the outside versus the rate of change on the inside. So winners are those whose the rate of change on the inside is greater than the rate of change on the outside. So they change before they are forced to. And one of the, my speakers alluded to that. They change before they are forced to. These are people you call visionary companies. These are people that look into the future and ask themselves what, would, what changes will happen in the next five years, in the next 10 years, and they begin to change now, even before those changes happen. Bill Gates captured it succinctly when he said that the secret of success is knowing where the world is going and being the first to get there. So you are the very first person to get there. You know where the world is going, but you are the very first to get there. That, those are winners. The second category are followers. Those are people, companies that they change, but they change with the change. So the rate of change internally is in step with the rate of change on the outside. So they are, they are succeeding, yes, but they are not in the class of the innovators, the visionary companies, but they are succeeding and surviving. And the third category are the people we call laggards. These are people that the rate of change on the inside is less, it's lower than the rate of change on the outside. So the question is not about changing. The question is, what is the speed of change and when does that change happen? Because to laggards, the change happens, but it happens a bit late and it becomes a change of crisis proportion. And if I want to ask my audience here this morning, listening to me, I'm sure that in your sector, in your country, you will know companies that are winners, that are followers, that are laggards. Let me ask you, would you where would you classify your own company? Would you put your company in the category of winners? Would you put your company in the category of followers? or would you put your company in the category of laggards? That is why we are here today, so that we can be in the class of winners. What are the key takeaways as I bring this first path? The necessity to, of changing of, of um, the culture of innovation, the necessity to close. Three things. Number one here is that the business environment is very unforgiving. We've seen that of companies that have gone. Business environment, is very unforgiving. Number two is that customer loyalty is fickle. 
I know we talk about customer loyalty, customer loyalty, but like the ghost town effect, people are not loyal to the town. They're only loyal to the town if the town provides them the things that they need for their livelihood. In the same vein, customers are not loyal to companies. They are only loyal to the companies that meet their needs. So when a company fails to meet their needs, the 1 billion customers of Nokia in 20, uh, 2007 has gone to Samsung, has gone to Apple, has gone to Huawei. They've gone to different companies. Customer loyalty is fickle. The only way we can guarantee customer loyalty is by bringing innovative services because money flows in that direction of efficient, but more importantly, innovative products and services. So innovation is one way to guarantee customer loyalty and guarantee organizational survival going into the future. The last quote in this particular segment is what Edward Deming said. I like this. It's not necessary to change. Why? Because survival is not mandatory. If survival is mandatory, if you want to be here in the next 10 to 15 years, then change becomes compulsory. But if for you, survival is not mandatory, then it's not necessary to change. I hope that first segment has made the business case on why we need a culture of innovation. Because if we don't, the ghost stand effect will happen. If we don't, our success today will become a relic of yesterday's tradition tomorrow. If we don't, customers will move in drove and it will, it will become history and a case study of why businesses fail. So that's the, that's the business case that I have made in a culture of innovation. Why is it necessary? The next path is now, so what exactly is a culture of innovation? And there are two words here. The first word is culture. And the second is innovation. I, I just want to do those two, you understand, so that I can combine them together. I want to do those two and combine together. The first word is culture. There are different ways we can define culture, but I, I want to see culture as a glue that binds people together. So there's something that brings us together in a common set of beliefs, assumptions. My last speaker talked about the place of assumptions, how we assume things, how we see things, the meaning we give to events the expectations we have of people and the behaviors that we put forth is a function of culture. So there's something that, that's common. We are Africans, for example, there's something that binds us together, a common set of assumptions, meaning expectations and behaviors. So, we, so when I see an average Nigerian outside Nigeria, there's something that is common to us outside. That's what the concept of culture is. It's a glue that binds the organization together. Now you cannot see that organizations have assumptions. Organizations have assumptions. Let me ask, can you people still hear me? Hello, can you people still hear me? Don't, don't tell me ask. We are hearing yeah. you, just go ahead. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Yes, we are, yes. Okay, so organizations have assumptions. This is called your organizational frame, your paradigm, and it's your culture that determines how you see the world. So put it in the context of organization, culture, and from an organizational lens, I said that culture is the lens that helps us make sense of the business environment, how we see the business as uh, environment, the assumptions we make about the business environment, the behaviors that we put forth is determined by our culture. So culture will help us make sense. That in interpretation will help us either adapt or align uh, in order to deliver results. So if the culture is wrong, it means that we will miss the signals in the business environment or we'll miss the implications of the signals in the business environment and I eventually that organization would fail. So the culture is a very powerful tool and see how it affects performance and innovation. People would define culture as a way people think and what they do. So it starts from your thought processes, your assumptions, the meaning, the interpretation, your thought processes will determine how you approach the business, your approach. Your approach will determine the solutions that you bring forth and that solutions you can't you cannot codify it into a body of knowledge that you pass to the next generation so from generation to generation as people come to the organization they are told this is how we do things in this particular organization and if you see this this is simply innovation because innovation requires us to think different 
approach things in a different manner, come up with new solutions and codify those solutions for the next generation to improve upon. So culture and innovation cannot be separated because it's the right culture that drives innovative processes in the organization. So what exactly is innovation here? Since we know that culture and innovation, there's a, there's, there's, there's a, there's a connect between the two. A, a simple definition would be finding new ways of doing old things, new and better ways of doing old things. That's what innovation is. So that new approaches, new solutions is in the context of innovation. But I like number two, which is about meeting the demands and the challenges of the future. So definition one looks at today, old things, what we are doing right now. Uh, innovation says, can we make it better? Can we make it easier? Can we make it more convenient? Can we make it cheaper? So innovation is success with the superlative, so to speak. So easier, faster, better, cheaper, whatever you want to call it, that's what innovation is. Definition two looks at the future and says, okay, how would the future be different and what do we need to do in order to deliver that? So today I am sitting in the comfort of my office in Lagos, Nigeria, and I'm making this presentation globally. People are listening to me across the Commonwealth nation. Innovation is about meeting those demands of the future. How would, how would we deliver uh, education? How would we deliver our service? That is what innovation asks in the future, and are we ready for that? I, I think this is just a quote that without innovation, humanity would have remained in caves. Every progress that humanity has made is simply a progress of innovation. Without innovation, would have remained in the hunter-gatherer area. We've moved from the hunter-gatherer area to the agrarian area. We've moved there to the industrial and the mechanized area. We've moved to the information and communication technology area. Uh, Peter Drucker says the, the knowledge worker area. Every, you know, every progress that humanity has made is simply a progress that has been fashioned and shaped by innovation. And Henry Harrower says, it's always safe to assume that not that the old way is wrong, but there might be a better way. And this is what innovation does. Is there a better way? That's what I've confirmed in my definition. Is there a better way? Is there a new way of delivering this service, of reaching out to customers? There might be a better way. But perhaps one of my best quotes in terms of innovation is from Albert Einstein. Albert Einstein gave the same exam questions to two different sets of students last year and this year, for example. And his research assistant said to him, Prof, the questions are the same. You understand? And, the, and, and, and Einstein responded, yes, the questions are the same, but the answers are different. And if you, look, if you apply this to the organizational context, the questions that we face are the same. The question of how do we grow our business, the question of how do we reach out to customers, the question of how do we deliver a better value than our competitors. The question has always been the same. How do we make money? The question has always been the same, but the answers of creating value for customers, the answers of delivering our product and services to customers, the answers are shifting and are changing with every year. And if you don't understand that the answers are changing, you'll be stuck in the old ways, and if you are not careful, the ghost stand effect would happen. So what is that culture of innovation? Now, understanding culture, understanding of innovation, a culture of innovation is one that guarantees continuous adaptation to external changes. So we are always adapting, adapt, innovate, evolve. It's one that helps the organization to reinvent itself to remain relevant. We are reinventing ourselves, we're evolving. We started business one way, this is how we delivered it one way. Think about even medicine. Today there are surgeries that you can perform without opening the body. Are, we are evolving, we're reinventing ourselves to remain relevant. And number three for me, it's very important. Innovation ultimately is about creating a quantum leap in value for customers and the organization. So we're asking ourselves, what else can we add to create that leap in value for our customers? And it requires us to challenge complacency. We never get to that point in an innovative culture where we are satisfied with what we have done. Yes, we are satisfied with our yesterday's success, but we know that the challenges of today are different. So we challenge complacency, we encourage creativity, and we support a contrarian thinking. People that are different, people that come up with new ideas so that we can make progress. In the last segment that I have, this is the third part, 
and I've done 18 minutes. I have the 12 minutes to go. Now, how can leaders foster a culture of innovation? So I've made a business case for you about the necessity where we need to innovate, the ghost and effect. Customers are not loyal. Money flows in the direction of innovation. We've talked about what a culture of innovation is. The glue that binds people together is culture, and innovation is finding new ways. And we've talked about what it means. It means that to continually adapt in order to deliver value for customers and what it has. The final part now says, what role can leaders play to foster a culture of innovation? And there are three points. There are so many points I could have left, but there are three major points I want to leave with you here in the role that leaders can play. And role number one is to decide and communicate why. That is to decide why do we need to innovate? Uh, I, my, my last speaker talked about passion, and I'm grateful he brought that. That passion goes beyond excitement. Passion is also about suffering. You understand? Decide and communicate why. Your why is your purpose. And your purpose is the fuel for motivation. So if there's no purpose, there will not be motivation. So the organization needs to know why do we need to innovate? And every time we look at the reasons for innovation, it will fall in four categories. I said based on the external effects or the internal challenges or based on the present and the future. Remember how we defined innovation, meeting, finding new ways of doing old things or meeting the demands or the challenges of the future. So these are the four major reasons why organizations innovate. One, to avoid an inferior competitive position. Two, to optimize current process. Three, to exploit untapped market opportunity. And four is simply to position for the future. So if you take it as verbs, or, or, or the word will be avoid, optimize, exploit, or reimagine. So you can, you can do innovation simply by reimagining your business processes and start, if we were to start this business all again, what, how would we do it differently? That's we imagine. Or what would the business of the future, the ICT of the future, the HR of the future, or the workforce of the future look like. That's we imagine. Avoid that is simply saying, we're not, we not doing this well. We cannot compete in this space. So it's either we improve on it or we exit. So exiting from a market that you cannot succeed is also a plan of innovation. It's either we can compete favorably or we exit. So if you don't have a competitive advantage, they tell, they say, don't compete. So that's avoidance. Optimizing is about magnifying what you're doing well right now. So you're very good in a particular area and you're optimizing it. And there are companies that have done optimizing. So they've optimized to expand. Lloyd, and one company that there's so many companies, so I, I want to mention names. What they've done is okay, we are very good in this particular area, we have these competencies, and how do we how do we make more money from it, or how do we take it and enter a new business segment? Every time a company innovates, it's in one of four reasons, and it's the leader's responsibility to communicate why we are innovating is that we are avoiding an inferior competitive position. We are optimizing our business processes. We want to exploit an untapped market opportunity, or we simply want to position ourselves for the future. The second reason, the second step is that the, the leaders have to communicate and decide uh, the type of innovation that they want. You need to provide guidance. And there are so many definitions or types. There are product innovation, there's service innovation, there's process innovation. You know, there's so many types of innovation. But I, I just want to say here, I want to put them in these three categories, new to the world, new to a customer segment, or new to us. Uh, new to the world is what they call breakthrough innovation. Mm -hmm. So it has never happened to before. It's new to the world. New to us is simply benchmarking. Benchmarking. Chair? You want to say something, Chair? Yes, Dr. Max, you have uh, three minutes to wind up. Thank you. I, I, what did you say? You have three minutes to wind up your presentation. Okay, that, that was not the, the timing because I have my time at all and it's 22 minutes. It's okay, it's fine. I, I was still 30 minutes. <laughs> uh, I, 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 I timed myself and I was working with you, but it's okay, it's fine. I, I need to, um, I'll, I'll summarize my, my, but the last point, it's um, uh, the, what I call the three I. And the three I is simply about information seeking, uh, interpretation and ideation and information uh, innovation management. Uh, because of, uh, let me just, I'll just summarize this because there's quite a, a lot here that I even have. What, what is information seeking? It, it says that innovation cannot happen except you have the right kind of information. In, information is the currency of innovation. 
And if you must make progress, if you must innovate, then you need to manage around three eyes. Three eyes is getting the right kind of information, information about customer needs, information about customer problems. And because of time's sake, let me just jump to this part. Uh, the iceberg of ignorance by Sydney Yoshida says that a lot of leaders at the top do not know what is happening on the shop floor. Now, somebody might argue about the 4%, it's, not, it's fine, but it just shows that there's a disconnect between leaders at the top and what is happening at the shop floor. Information management is looking for the right kind of information, opening the communication channels of accord. This is information and communication technology, ICT. So how do we open it? That our people are free to speak, that our people are open. I can get the information that I need in order to deliver what I want. That's the first part, information management. The second is what I talked about, interpretation and ideation. So when we get the information, what do we do with the information? How we interpret it? Are, are people free to disagree? Are people free to debate? Are people free to challenge different points? That is interpretation and ideation. So information management is getting the information. Interpretation that says, okay, in the, in the process of interpreting it, how do we go about this? And the last part is now innovation management. For time's sake, because I just want, I, I need to jump. Let me just end with this last part. And this is the last part. This is my, uh, you understand. The last part is how do we create innovative cultures in terms of innovation management? You see, most times people think that innovation is fun. Yes, but it, there's a balancing act. And I like the article by Gary Pisano. He's a Harvard professor who wrote an article about the hard truth of innovative cultures. You know what is he said, he said there has to be tolerance for failure, which is good, but tolerance for failure must be balanced with no tolerance for incompetence. And this is where HR comes into play. If you want people to, you want to tolerate failure, are, are we going to be failing and just failing for the sake of failing? No. It means that we need to employ very competent people and we need to challenge them to high standards of performance. Then when we have competent people that we challenge to high standards of performance with a vigorous performance management system, then we can do tolerance for failure because we know our people are competent and they will not make the kind of stupid mistake that can destroy the organization like the Barron's Bank. Then and you come to willingness to experiment, but there has to be rigorous discipline. Somebody will say Google gives their staff 20 minutes in order and 20% of their time to decide what they want to do. But you forget that in that 20%, you must declare to the organization what you're doing with your time. So there's a concept of discipline with the willingness to experiment. The, the kind of innovation we choose, is this something that will add value? How do we choose the innovation to pursue? How do we, uh, what process are we going to institute in place to know when to call it off or when we are going on an ego trip is the concept of rigorous discipline. Number three is psychological safety. Uh, safety is people should be free to speak up, but just like you are free to speak of, you should also be free to receive the feedback that I'll give to you, which is brutal candor. So we need to balance the two, psychological safety, the freedom to speak of, and candidness, the freedom to receive information. Number four is collaboration. Collaboration is that we're working together, but hey, collaboration can lead to consensus and consensus will not lead to innovation or consensus will lead to suboptimal innovation. You need to balance the willingness to work together with individual accountability. Somebody has to be in charge. The buck has to stop with somebody's table and that person knows I am responsible for the success and the failure of the team. And number five, which is where I end, is flat structure with strong leadership. So there is a balancing act, and this is where leaders, leaders play a major role. How do we balance the fun part with the hard part without tilting too much? If you have vigorous discipline without a willingness to experiment, it will be a very tense and tough culture and people will leave. That is the singular role that leaders bring, that balancing act to ensure that the culture is is viable enough for innovation. People are challenged and for people are also supported. It's on that note, I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for your time and the opportunity to make this presentation. Thank you, thank you, do have a great day.